Welcome to Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs with me, the Reverend Jamie Franklin. And as it was last week, I was going to say in the beginning and ever shall be, but that would be ridiculous, is uh, Thomas Pelham. Tom, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, Jamie. How are you? I, I noticed you've had a haircut or you've, you've cut your own hair. I know you, you, you do it yourself these days, don't you? I've cut my hair and I've trimmed my beard back, uh, which I do about once a year. Um, just to, just like a hedge, just to keep it healthy. It just, it just makes your head look small now. That's the problem. Um, yes, yes. Well, one's <laughs> the size of one's head, uh, fortunately, does not determine the uh, quality of mind yeah. or character. As but, uh, I think you'll have heard of the, uh, I, th- I think it was a science in the nineteenth century uh, called phrenology. Have you yeah, they measured that? they measured various bits of people's heads, and they, th- they decided they could. Uh, um, tell the character of the person from it there's a a entertaining parody of this in terry pratchett and it's one of those things that you can almost believe uh, was would be true but i I suspect it isn't um in uh where they where the science is taken to its inevitable conclusion of attempting to change people's characters by changing the quality of their skull uh, with a hammer (laughs) 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 um, but yes um yeah well well fortunately in the words of um smithers in uh, The Simpsons, the, the, the practice of phrenology was dismissed as quackery 150 years ago, um, to which I believe Mr. Burns replies, uh, you would say that you have the brain pan of a stagecoach tilter. <laughs> so there we go. Hey, you know what happened, Tom? This week is I had some people come to church who listened to the show, and they very specifically said that um, I shouldn't interrupt you when you're talking about cycling. They want more cycling talk and less talk about football, which is a shame because Spurs won their first, did you see this? They trashed I, Manchester City, trashed I, them. Harry Kane wasn't even playing. And Harry Kane, ironically, wants to go to Manchester City. And all the, the crowds are back now. So this is fantastic. The crowd of 60,000 people shouting, are you watching Harry Kane? As the Spurs players paraded around in their victorious pomp. It was, it was genuinely uh, brilliant. But as I said, not allowed to talk about that because Jamie, Michelle, Michelle doesn't want that. What were you going to say? It's not going to last, though, is it? It's it, your false hope. All it is is a false hope, Spurs. You, they're well, not going to go anywhere. It's they're going to get beaten by the middle of the season. You'll be your normal, dispirited self. Um, it's true. It's just you I know. I believe this time. I believe this time. <laughs> but, but, as I said, look, Michelle doesn't want this, right? She doesn't want. Sorry, she doesn't Michelle. Want, she doesn't want football. She wants cycling. So, Tom, tell us something about cycling. Well, what? it's the, it's the it's the um, Vuelta at the moment, I believe, isn't it? Uh, but I haven't really been. Vuelta, the Vuelta de Spanol. Vuelta? Vuelta, is that, not, is that not how you say it? I don't know, I don't even know what you're saying. Anyway, carry on. Carry uh, on. I may, I, I, my Spanish pronunciation is awful, so um, I believe it is. Anyway, but I haven't got the subscription to watch it, and it's not covered anywhere near as much as the uh, Tour de France. But um, right, right, right. The, uh, do you know, um, I believe the latest cycling news is that Cavendish is scheduled to, to ride in the Tour, Tour of Britain, which is a September one. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's always nice. He's always a crowd pleaser. Yeah. Um, very sad that he didn't make his uh well he called eddie Merckx but didn't didn't beat him but that's probably i mean um probably fair um in a sense that eddie Merckx uh probably deserves to have his record unbeaten uh, do you know about eddie Merckx? have you heard of eddie Merckx? We, yeah, i think you mentioned it on the show last week but no it wasn't last week it was it was a, lo- a long time ago but uh, uh it was um eddie Merckx is is, is is a legend of cycling one of the, one of the greatest cyclists that's ever it. you know a legend Head, uh, head and shoulders above um, any of his competitors, uh, a real, um, you know, a, a real legend. Um, and he has, the, he had until this year, the single highest number of Tour de France stage wins. Uh, and now it's been equaled by Cavendish. So there we yes. go. There's a bit of, which is good. Uh, it's lovely to see these things happen, but, but Cavendish is a sprinter and they tend to win more stages because it's their job. Eddie Merckx won every single type of stage. So he was a climber. He was, he was a time trialist. You know, there was, wasn't a type of stage he didn't excel at. So, um, and so Cavendish, is he, he's English, is he? He's, he's Manx. Right. And that's English. Well, it's not, is it? It's Manx. Manx. What? He's from the Isle of Man? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Is that not English? Well, I, I think they define themselves as Manx rather than English. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's yeah, part it's of the kingdom. Own, it's its own principality, isn't it? Um, I uh, don't know. Uh, it's its that's own right. thing. It's certainly, you know, it's, it's not. Uh, thing. Is that the technical term? Its own thing. Um, it's thing. But yeah, no, well, there we go. There's a bit of cycling. It's cricket, of course, is the other thing that's, that, that I follow. She didn't ask for cricket. But she didn't anyway, ask for cricket, sorry. Well, cricket, go ahead. Cricket's good. 
Do it. <laughs> no, I'm not interested in cricket, really. Why are you not interested in cricket? It's the best. Well, I only really like football. That's a sport I like. It's because you're a yob. Um, I'm not a yob. It is. It's because you were born in Essex. That's the problem here. That is a common and completely <laughs> unfair stereotype. There are some very nice areas in Essex. Uh, yeah, um, I know. But um, with, with the problem is, not. the problem is that you just haven't got the culture to appreciate cricket, which is which is. I have, I, Tom, I, look, that is ridiculous. I grew up watching cricket and playing cricket at school. I just don't like it very much. I just find, I just don't find it as exciting. You have to have a lot of time to watch cricket, and I yeah. don't have time. I just, you, I'm busy. It what you lack, like, Jamie, is not time, but patience. You lack patience. No. Uh, <laughs> I, don't with, I don't agree with that. Anyway, ca- carry on. What do you want to say about cricket? Well, England lost to India, of course, is the, is the other sporting news. Uh, well, it is a shame. Well, I mean, they deserve to lose. They made some very bad, bad tactical errors. Are, they, um, are the England cricket team as woke as the English football team? I don't think so. Do they take the knee? I, I haven't watched. It may, it'd, be, it'd be hard to know when to take it, though, wouldn't it? I mean, would they do it at the beginning of every over? And can well, that'd you, be can, silly. Can you take the knee in those big pads? Probably not. Probably not. No. You'd have to take... Only the, only the fielding team would be able to take the knee at any one time, I think. You know, they often take the knee anyway to do catches, don't they? So they do, be, yeah. It'd be hard. Maybe they've been, maybe they've been supporters of BLM for, for decades. Yes. It's a very sort of... Um, in all seriousness, it's a very sort of colonialist thing, isn't it? Um, cricket. And the fact that the fact that India are beating England is sort of a, a, the circle, you know, I, I the just, full, full circle type thing, isn't it? I, I, I don't, don't know whether that's fair, actually. In, India have, uh, had long had a great cricketing um, team. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, it, just because it, it's gone out to the British Empire doesn't mean it's colonial. I mean, I think it's no, just no, a but, good cricket. No, what, what, what I mean is that the reason that Indians play cricket is because of the British Empire, isn't it? Well, the, probably the reason they play football is because of the British Empire. Yeah, but it's not... Come on, Tom. There's no, there's no sort of culture of football in, in India. There's no Indian football team of any notoriety. I don't even know that there, there is one. You don't see the Indian football team in the World Cup, do you? I presume they do have one, but no, you don't. No. Yeah, it's not very good if it exists. Anyway, you, you get my point. Right, uh, uh, yeah. I think we've done enough of that. Do you, do you agree with I that? Think so. I think so, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah. I hope that's... So what I was going to say is um, I accept all criticism and guidance and everything. But if you do show up at my church and give me feedback face-to-face, there's more... There's a higher degree of likelihood that I'll take it seriously and uh, insert it into the show, as I've demonstrated here. So I hope that, <laughs> hope that satisfies I've, everyone. I've got some news, actually, which I can, which I can tell people, can't I? All right, yes, yes. Yeah, I have. It's very exciting news. My, uh, my, everyone should know that I'm a curate, uh, but, I, but won't be for very much longer. Um, I've, I've been appointed uh, to, a, um, to a post yes. uh, in Burwash in East Sussex in the Diocese of Chichester. Lovely. Um, it's the director of Burwash, Burwash, Weald and Etchingham. So very much looking forward to, uh, to going there. And if any of you are East Sussex um, sorts, uh, I'll be there from probably from around about November, but it's not yet confirmed. Yeah. Um, so we're Fantastic. looking forward to that. Hmm. Yeah. So, if, so people who live near there, if they want to go to church, they can just come to your church. Don't they, they could come to my church. And then if they gave me feedback, I'd probably implement it as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Congratulations, Tom. That's really good news. Thank you, Jamie. Thank That's you. really good news. And I'm sure that I'm sure the people there will be getting a fine, fully trained priest, uh, having come from the hallowed halls of Cudston, all the way via Paul and Sandbanks and Harry Redknapp's house. You're now heading out to the Diocese of Chichester, to the far flung corners of the Diocese of Chichester in the southeast of England. That's uh, brilliant news. Tom, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, sure, I'm sure there'll be some listeners who are, their hearts have just leapt because they'll be thinking, oh, Tom is now going to be ministering. In, uh, he's, going to be, he's going to be celebrating the sacrifice of the mass right near where I live, right let's, around the corner. Let's not go there, Jamie. Let's not go there. That oh, was just um, a joke for everyone. No, who, well, not, it's not really a joke, but it's, a kind of, it's an attempt of mine to wind Tom up with, uh, with intentionally Catholic language. Um, speaking of um, Christianity, Tom, because that is our thing, really. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. It's our sort of USP, isn't it? We're not medical doctors, you know, we're not sociologists. We are uh, ostensibly um, theologically equipped uh, Christian priests. If, you, if you're happy with the word priest? 
Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Presbyter, reading, yeah. Reading, well, okay, right. So, yeah, so you're not happy with it. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's not have an argument about that. Oh, by the way, um, just to everyone, Daniel sends his apologies. He was going to be with us, but um, something came up and he couldn't come. This week, we're hoping to have him next week. Um, so, sorry about that. I'm, I'm sure that's a great disappointment to everyone. It's a disappointment to me, Jamie, because it just, you know, it, it's, actually, it's actually much easier to concentrate um, on Daniel's voice. Really? Uh, I think, yeah. Well, it's just it's a bit it's a bit more mellow. Oh, yeah, yeah. People often tell me, <laughs> like my mum often tells me that she likes my voice. Oh, so. no, it's nice voice, Jamie. It's nice voice. Ah, yeah. uh, come on, you've, you've <laughs> right. Let's turn to uh, scripture, Tom. I've been yeah. uh, doing a bit of catechesis recently, and um, I was uh, doing one on the incarnation. And um, I thought that today I would share from John chapter one verse 14 because i've been pondering the mystery the word became flesh now the verse here is it obviously in the prologue to the gospel of john the great one of the greatest is one of the greatest passages in all of scripture isn't it tom in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god do you agree it's it's, one uh, of it's, it's not it's not just the greatest passage in scripture jamie i mean it transcends all all literature i think one of the yes. one of the greatest things ever uh, penned by a human hand um Yes. With sort of inspiration uh, from the divine is the only way it could ever have happened, of course. But yeah, go, go on, Jamie. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. And if anyone's, you know, so but first getting into scripture and wondering, you know, where should I, what should I start by reading? Uh, the Gospel of John is always a brilliant place to start. And of course, the first chapter is a wonderful chapter about the incarnation of Christ. Um, and I wanted to particularly focus on verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only son of the father. And um, one of the interesting things about the incarnation is to uh, consider it uh, not just from the perspective of Christ's life and death, but from the purely ontological uh, perspective. And what I mean by that is what does it mean that God takes on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ? What is the what is the significance of that? in terms of the relationship between humanity and divinity. I've been reading this really good book on priesthood by Graham Tomlin, where he makes the point that in many um, many Greek uh, philosophical understandings and uh, in early Christian heretical understandings, such as Gnosticism, the divine and his creation are always separated from each other. They're not, they're not, they're not, intermingled and they they have a great distance because it's held to be the case that the the realm of the divine or heaven is something which is pristine and pure and that creation is actually very far away from the divine and is 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 it corrupted i suppose would be the best word not necessarily evil but corrupted by virtue of the fact that it's far away from far away from god and far away from the heavenly realm and so in gnosticism you get I mean, if anyone's ever read the beginning of um, Irenaeus, the Church Fathers Against Heresies, you get all these kind of intermediary demiurges, you know, these kind of these kind of um, godlike figures, which are which are one rank beneath the true God. And they one of them or multiple ones of them actually are held to have created the earth because it would have been too too um, too low a thing for the for the one high God to have created the earth. And of course, in in Platonism, particularly in in Neoplatonic. Uh, cosmology you have this kind of descending these descending degrees of um of being with with creation at the very bottom uh, and the one at the top divided by a series of intermediaries now the thing that's so amazing about the Chris well there are many things that are amazing about the Christian doctrine of the incarnation but one of them is certainly that in the incarnation the divine and his his creation, specifically in humanity, become one. They become intermingled with each other. Um, the The word becomes flesh. God comes and lives here among us, and he gives humanity the capacity to participate in divinity through the incarnation. And um, anyone who knows anything about Eastern Orthodoxy will know that this is um, something which is absolutely central to their their theory or their understanding of how human beings are saved, that we become ultimately divine, sorry, we become partakers of the divine nature, that we participate in the divine nature through being united to God through Christ in the incarnation. So the word becomes flesh and then flesh, as it were, 
becomes united to divinity through the word. And so our ultimate end is actually to transcend what we have by nature through grace, through the grace ultimately of, of Jesus Christ. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And of course, the, the atonement and uh, the resurrection and the ascension are all central to that as well. But in that just basic ontological understanding of, of divinity coming and uniting itself with humanity in order to raise humanity up with divinity, we see something at the very heart of the good news of the gospel. Um, and it, I, was, I was thinking about this in terms of our conversations over the last few weeks or months, Tom. You know, uh, it's very much the case that I believe that the secular or the secular realm is a kind it, it because you can't you can't get rid of religion and and particularly in the west and, and in the post-christian west you can't really get rid of christianity and so what what secularism really is in my view is a kind of parody or it's a series of parodies of christianity and i was thinking about the incarnation particularly with reference to to transhumanism and uh, and and what what we might call trans transnaturism, if you like. So transhumanism is an attempt to sort of improve humanity uh, through technology, um, and transnaturism would be a word I've made up in order to describe a situation where we're trying to kind of elevate ourselves beyond or above the natural course of things, trying to make ourselves completely free of disease, for example. Um, both of these things are attempts by human beings within our own power to raise ourselves and the world around us, I suppose, to a state which is free from the limitations of, of sin and death. And so in this sense, the, the sort of transhuman cyborg that I was talking about with Daniel a few weeks ago, you remember, I don't know whether you heard that one, we were talking about the sort of augmented humanity. That mm -hmm. transhuman cyborg is kind of a parody of the resurrection body. Uh, in Christianity. So in, in the great chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, St. Paul talks about the way that Christ's resurrection body is a pattern of our resurrection bodies, that one day through faith in Christ, we will be raised from the dead with this glorious, um, this glorious, powerful, honorable body, uh, which will be like a renewal uh, of, our, of our earthly body. And it struck me how the transhuman cyborg is a kind of, is a parody of that. It's, it's a wish to sort of emulate that but through human and technological means. Um, and so, in a sense, you can see the, the yearning of humanity for something like resurrection in these attempts to transcend nature. But of course, we know that it's only by uniting our humanity to Christ's divinity that we can truly, ultimately, transcend what we are by nature and be united to what he is by nature, which is, which is truly divine and the second person of the Trinity. So that's, that's kind of my reflection today. Hmm. Well, that's a good one, Jamie. I think, uh, I think there's something also about, um, if we're gonna sort of extend that out uh, to, um, to, to, to sort of uh, some of the topical things at the moment, this idea that, um, that we can, uh, that we can as humans on our own, um, transcend our own state uh, or, or indeed discard bits of us that we don't we don't want um you know like like the like the lockdowns requiring us to discard sort of great chunks of what it means to be a human or um yeah. uh or, or you know trans the sort of transgender philosophy um sort of denying the physical rootedness of ourselves that they're all they're all sort of countered by by this and the, and the problem when the church um when the church uh, accept some of these things as sort of um, uh, as writ effectively as, as sort of givens um, is, is that we, we start talking in, in a completely different uh, ontological makeup of humanity than, than, than the one that's given to us by the Bible, uh, by, by Christ. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, I sort of, I was having a chat with someone the other day about this sort of um, uh, this cartoon um, the, of you know and i think we might have mentioned it last week of of, of a shark um you know saying oh freedom <clears throat> for me is freedom to eat all the fish and this idea that freedom is dangerous um but actually uh, this this requires us to to sort of take parts of and this is this was discussed by a sort of senior uh, one of the people in the church of england responsible for the covid response um you know in the covid so called covid recovery group um i believe and uh this idea that that the sort of we can just discard the communal aspects of humanity 
and see them as 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 uh, as not essential that we can just become online presence only that, that, that we can uh, that we can render ourselves uh, you know away from our physical needs to meet people to see people to to, to hug to shake hands um, is is dangerous yeah. because because it means that we can't um, because it means we can't flourish as humanity yeah. uh, you know that the Christ became fully human so that we can be fully human yeah. um, in the end yeah, and I think um, as well, there's something interesting there about the view of matter. And I, I think we may we may talk. I think we talked about this many many months ago, um, in the sort of Gnostic or in in certain sort of understandings of, of Platonism as well. Matter is is held to have a very low status, and to and to and and you often get this kind of duality. Um, in the human being between matter and spirit body and spirit so the body is kind of like a prison for the spirit which is the which is the real um, humanity now again this this is sort of runs contrary to the incarnation because in taking on flesh god as it were hallows matter by uniting himself to it and so it should say something to us about the importance of our physical bodies. I mean, not least because the doctrine of the resurrection of the body says that our bodies will be raised and, and our bodies will be ultimately made immortal. And that is part of God's purpose for us. So I think with um, something like transgenderism, you often hear, and we'll talk about this uh, later when we talk about what's going on in Scotland at the moment, but you hear this kind of language of like a blue body and a pink brain or something like that. Um, and of course, the brain is part of the body, so it can't it can't mean the physical brain. It must mean something more sort of spiritual and esoteric. And so the implication is that the body is, if you like, wrong. It's the wrong colour, but the spirit is is right. And and what has to happen is that the spirit has to take priority. So there's this kind of radical duality in in that anthropology, which I think the doctrine of the incarnation really challenges quite significantly do, do you know uh, messian's la nativity i don't know no no I'm, I'm a big fan of messian and his organ works they're not they're not for everyone it must be said but um it's quite interesting that this sort of um it's an interesting portrayal of the incarnation we think of christmas uh, uh well and the nativity rather than the incarnation the incarnation of course happened nine months before uh christmas and the, the nativity but um we we think of um we think of this as a sort of time of gentle sort of merriness, uh, merry carols, merry uh, sort of um, music, gentle, um, you know, merry holding the child. Uh, and really, um, uh, th there's elements of that, certainly. Uh, but the thing I love about Messian's uh, portrayal of it um, and his organ work is that it's, it, it's, it's sort of cataclysmic. It's, it's great sort of chunks of sound worlds sort of colliding against each other. Mm. Uh, and really the, the incarnation was, was, was just that it was a, um, uh, it was, it was a, it was a cataclysmic event in, in sort of, in terms of metaphysics, in terms of um, what we can say about ourselves, in terms of what we can say about creation, um, because it, it bridges a divide, um, and, and yeah, it is. It is. It is. You know, just as cataclysmic as the as the um, as the uh, the comet, uh, sort of the, the meteor, right? That wiped out the dinosaurs. That sort of you know that sort of level of uh, greater than that, bigger than the single biggest event ever to happen. Um, Inaug inaugurating a new epoch. Yeah. In, uh, in 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 the world, or have you on put it? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'll I'll listen to that, Tom, and I uh, and I'll I'll put a note on the show notes as well for anyone who wants to. He wants to go and um, we can do, we can, we can broaden out this scripture section to have, um, was I did, uh, when I did biblical studies, there's something called reception history. Did you ever come across that? Where, I do know, um, yeah. Where my, my, one of my tutors at King's described it as biblical studies on holiday, because it's basically like you just listen to pieces of music or look at pieces of art, which are something to do with the Bible um so it's a little bit that's a bit of a joke obviously I, I don't want to disparage it there is actually a very good uh, online website called the visual commentary on scripture have you ever seen that it's put together no, I haven't, by, no. put together one by one of my old supervisors ben quash um it's vcs.com i think you can just look it up um and it's, it they take three pieces of art and then do a little uh, based on a scriptural passage and then they do a little commentary on it so it can be quite helpful you know if you're meditating on something or if you're 
preparing a sermon or something like that, visual commentary on scripture. Uh, but there could be an audio commentary on scripture as well, couldn't there? Uh, could. They could. They're definitely good. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's good, Tom. That's good stuff. Um, so we, we thank God for taking on flesh in the person of Christ and, and coming among us. And uh, of course, um, for all you folks out there, uh, we hope that you uh, know the presence of Christ in your life as well. And uh, I think we should move on to talk about some news, Tom. Yeah, 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 some definitely. News. So um, this week we've got the, the big news about uh, the withdrawal of American and British troops from Afghanistan. And we've got a really interesting article from, from Unheard to talk about. But just, I mean, in terms of, I thought it might be good just to talk about our own sort of um, personal reflections on this to begin with. I mean, I, I remember I was actually at school when uh, we first went into Afghanistan. And I didn't, I never really understood. When I was a child, I think what I thought was, I don't really understand the logic of what's going on here. And I thought that that was because I was just was ignorant and that I was too stupid to understand. But actually, as I grow up, as I grow up, and certainly now, what I think is uh, my childish understanding of it was actually, there was something in my instinct that was actually correct, which was that I, I never really sort of bought the idea that you could have a war on terror because it seemed to me to be very abstract and i never understood how um how having a war on terror re was related to invading a particular geographical region of the earth um so i always found the justification for it spurious and it, it always did seem to me that there was a problem in going into another country and invading it in order to you know um preclude terror and and it seemed it seemed idealistic and vague. And I was actually listening to um, I was listening to a really good podcast actually called "The Rest Is History" by uh, which has got Dominic Sandbrook and Tom Holland. And they did this quote from Tony Blair at the beginning, from just before the invasion of Inga, or it might have been just after. But anyway, Blair spoke about um, reordering our world. He was saying, you know, the uh, he may he used this metaphor. I can't remember what it is, but some kind of metaphor about things being kind of shaken up and moved around. And he said something like, "Now is the time to reorder our world." And I thought that's very interesting, isn't it? That somebody like Blair, even 20 years ago, was speaking and thinking in that way. That we have the power to sign something off and and simply reorder things uh, in this in this geopolitical way. And actually, what we see 20 years later is really, I think everyone would agree more or less the complete failure really of that of that desire to to manipulate and mold the region of afghanistan into a, into an arena of uh, that that represents western values so i don't know i don't know what your your take is on it tom well i mean you know it's it's a it's a truism isn't it you know it's a bit like um uh we know that invading afghanistan has never really worked historically because um it's it's a sort of um it's a hard to invade place with a disparate and disunited people that um that that, that has ne we tried it in the 19th century we tried it uh, russia tried it in the 20th century we did it again in the 21st century they've all come to the same result which is a waste of time well um, i think i think the second afghan war was the most successful at the begin at the end of the 19th century that's actually the war that dr watson fought in Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. so that was slightly more successful but basically you're right they're all they're all pretty much disasters but yeah yeah sorry. Uh, the, the, the big problem is though that that um that i mean yes the taliban funded al-qaeda uh that's uh that's a that's a bad thing for them to have done uh but um but but you but it's quite clear that we haven't managed to stop the taliban being the taliban and presumably they'll start funding al-qaeda again or whatever replacement uh hardline islamist sort of terror cells they they, they choose to um you know we, we've achieved absolutely nothing in in 20 years uh it's it's it's, it's a it's a it was been a waste of time effort money uh because they never really thought about what would replace what was there and it's much the same uh problem as uh as we we saw in um uh, is it Tunisia? No, not Tunisia. What's the next one to it? Uh, with um, oh, um, Libya. Libya, yeah, where we where we sort of uh, 
helped displace the ruling uh, caste there. Uh, and uh, also um, we saw in Iraq uh, where they didn't really have a solid plan to replace Saddam Hussein. Uh, and Afghanistan, the same mistake made three times in the space of 20 years. Um, and the only the only thing I'm glad about is we didn't sort of make the same mistake in Syria, where you know if we'd gone in and removed uh, Bashir Assad for all his evil deeds, uh, what would have replaced him? Um, well, li likely it would have been ISIS, and we'd have, would have been in the same same position again. So I think um, I think uh, yeah, I, I just it feels like a bit of a inevitable. I mean, I guess we could have stayed there. And the Americans could have kept propping up this government that no one there, obviously no one there really wants, uh, or and continue taking sort of money, billions of pounds of money and and sort of trickle of uh, casualties, yeah. or they could have pulled out. Um, I mean, it's, it's not obvious that if they'd pulled out 10 years ago or in 10 years time that, that, that the result would have been any different. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, you know, it's, it's so the problem there it goes it's, it's going in in the first place isn't it, it, it ill-defined unclear um sort yeah. of war that, that that that's turned out with an ill-defined unclear end yeah so well. it's really really interesting um the um it, it put this this whole thing put me in mind of a of an article that was published um four years ago which was by uh, an academic called uh, bruce gilly and it was called the case for colonialism and he made a number of articles, uh, sorry, made a, a number of arguments in favour of colonialism, how it's been historically beneficial to certain nations, not to every nation, but, but to certain nations, and that we should reevaluate the notion of colonialism as potentially um, valuable to certain, certain nations today in a geopolitical sense. And the art, there was a huge outcry, as you can imagine. I mean, it's not okay to write things like this in... in academia at the moment unfortunately but there's huge out outcome and, the, and the, the the article was actually withdrawn at the author's request in the end but it strikes me that this is actually a really good example of the kind of thing that Bruce Gilley is talking about and um, because this is I think what's going on here is that we're kind of falling between two stools um, you know you can you can not do anything and let them govern themselves how they want um, or the other alternative really is to make them into a colony and and to and to be there permanently to establish a permanent colonial government in order to govern the country. And what's actually happened is something in the middle, which has gone there. We tried to establish a kind of a kind of government, which, as you say, Tom, doesn't work. And then we've realised it doesn't work, and now we're and now we're leaving, and it's just going back to the way things were before. So actually, this is a, you know, and I'm not I'm not saying this because I'm about to say something that's far more critical. But in terms of in terms of what we've done, it's a kind of half-baked act of colonialism. And I think it might be because of America's understanding of itself historically as a kind of anti-colonial um, empire, essentially. It's, it's a paradoxical thing but, uh, that America wants to, it wants to involve itself in geopolitical affairs in this very interventionist way at points. But also it's, it's got this very anti-colonial view of itself you know they were the ones who threw off the colonial oppressors the british um in order to be free um but actually their their relationship to other countries in terms of colonialism is much more ambiguous and i think that's part of the reason that there's this huge um this huge kind of ideological confusion over what the heck we're actually meant to be doing in these countries um yeah. But let's let's talk a little bit about this this uh, really interesting unheard article, which is called "Why the West Will Collapse." And as always, I'll put it on the show notes. And uh, now uh, the sorry, I, I haven't made a note of the chap's name. Let's have a look because uh, I want to give him credit. Paul, Paul Kingsnorth. Paul Kingsnorth. Yeah, very good. Paul Kingsnorth. So really good, really good article. And I think one of the things that Paul Kingsnorth does really well here, uh, obviously really well because because I agree with it, is he makes the point that um, the West. Uh, comes out of Christendom. Uh, the West and its values comes out of Christendom. And that this, is in, this includes the values that we take for granted today, um, you know, fairness, um, justice, tolerance, freedom, etc. All of these are kind of um, Western values which derive from Christianity. Now, the problem is, to, um, to put it 
in a in a in a, in a concise way is that Christendom has event, essentially collapsed. Uh, mm -hmm. We no longer derive our values from Christianity, and therefore the West is doomed. And he does a very good short analysis of, of Alistair McIntyre's argument in um, After Virtue, which is essentially that around the time of the Enlightenment, so 17th, 18th century, there was this attempt to divorce morality from theology, which has essentially been a failure. And we've ended up with something like a kind of subjective emotivism. Things are right or wrong because I feel that they are. And of course, I think we've seen this a lot with the COVID thing. There's been no proper kind of moral or ethical debate. It's just about people's feelings. And so the modern order is, is a process of removing the sacred from the social and replacing it with abstract ideas, um, which, are, which are unmoored from their origins. So progress, liberty, democracy, freedom, etc. Justice would be another one. Now, these are all... I think, I think one, of the, one of the places you can see this is the attempts to have... Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Jamie. Okay, the attempts sorry. to have British values in schools. And, and, they're, and they're, you know, they're unrooted to anything. They're, they're, they're just sort of meaningless sentences. Um, yeah. You know, uh, or, or, the, or, the, or the wonderful... Uh, I say wonderful. Um, the, the, the girl guides change their promise to be, to be true unto myself as, rather than to be true to God. Uh, you know, completely yeah. meaningless sentence. You could, you could be a, a true to yourself and be a thoroughly nasty person. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the, you know, it's, you can see it again and again, this breakdown, this sort of, these values just sort of hanging around without a framework to fit them into. Freedom means nothing in and of itself. Yep. nothing it's just a word anyway go on and we, well, we were talking about that last week yeah. without without the christian framework freedom just means the capacity to make choices which yeah. are not restrained by anything so so a kind of spontaneous act of the will which is actually an illusion anyway because we're complete our, illusion yeah all we're, of we're our conditioned are, yeah all of our cho choices are constrained in some way or another whereas a truly christian understanding of freedom is the freedom to become that which you were created to be in the first place. That's what it is to really be free. There's lovely, of course you will know this well, Tom, the, um, the, this, the second collect after the collect of the, the week in, in the Book of Common Prayer and Morning Prayer, um, whose service is perfect freedom. The service of God is perfect freedom to keep God's yeah. commands. That's what perfect freedom is. It's completely the opposite of being constrained and, and in bondage uh, because that's what it is to be what God created us to be. Anyway, so just to return to this, um, his conclusion is it's just entirely drawn from After Virtue, which is that at the end of After Virtue, Alistair McIntyre talks about the way that we need a new St. Benedict in order to save the West. Because if you look at St. Benedict and the monastic tradition, uh, which came about just after the end of the, sorry, just after the fall of the Roman Empire, there was really in the monasteries uh, using the Benedictine or the rule of St. Benedict, I should say, uh, they preserved the culture of Western civilization. And really, we need, we, need, we need saints now, is kind of what he says, in order to save and preserve the West. Now, what he doesn't say, which I think is the, the obvious conclusion, is what we actually need is a revival of Christianity in some form. Um, because uh, you, can't just have, you can't just have preservation for the sake of it. I think that's what this, this, whole, this whole argument points towards is that when you unmoor things from their origin what you have loses its value and eventually people see it for what it is which is that it's empty and they start looking in other places so you can't just you can't just preserve it you can't have a saint benedict outside of christendom you so we need a return of christendom in order to produce a saint benedict as I don't know, I don't know what that, that's look, that will look like, but the only way, and I, I know I've said this a lot, but the only way that we can save these values, um, which I think to a certain degrees and in different ways have been distorted, but the only way that we can save them is by returning to where we got them from in the first place. Uh, you know, otherwise, otherwise they will inevitably change and they'll, they'll take on meanings which, which are completely different and contrary to the meanings that we we used to give them. So the, the word freedom, for example, uh, that, that word now in the way that it's, it's defined could be the freedom to end, end, one, uh, end one's own life, um, to, to commit suicide. That, that's a, that's a, you know, to, to euthanize oneself or something like that. That, that is utilizing the word freedom in a way which is completely at odds with the Christian understanding of it. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, that's my, that's my view, Tom. Uh, just before I apply to it, Afghanistan, I don't know what your take is on that. No, I, I I agree, Jamie. I think I think um, I think 
uh, goes, you know, uh, the, 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 the concept of a sort of selfish freedom isn't known uh, in, in um, it doesn't come out of Christianity, it comes out of secularism in, in a sense. Uh, it comes out of sort of speculation about the, the status of humanity that's uh, not rooted in a, in a sort of God-given uh, order. Um, I, I sort of, I guess I want to, and you're probably going to disagree with me now, is, is talk a little bit about St. Augustine, because he did a lot of thinking about what it means to be free. And his sort of conclusion was uh, that before we, um, before we know the grace of God, we are like an, an old-fashioned scale that's that's been weighted uh, on the wrong side, on one side. So it's it's sort of our, our sense of um, our, our will, uh, which and the exercise for Augustine, the exercise of will is is um, is what gives us our freedom. Um, and so it, before before we accept the grace of God, uh, that the the scales are unbalanced and we're unable in our own kind of will to, to will the right things. So, so our, so we are disordered uh, and we tend to, we tend to desire things that aren't God. Um, and it's only with grace that we can uh, properly uh, sort of uh, properly equip ourselves uh, only with the help of God to, to do good um, and to order ourselves towards God, which is pretty much the definition of what good might be. Um, and I think, uh, I think this is really an interesting way of looking at the world because, because essentially, and one thing I, I kind of muse about is that, you know, if, if everyone had true freedom of will, then surely no one would do deliberately do the bad thing because it would be an obviously, obviously a, a sort of aligning yourself away from God. Um, so this is kind of this, this is the, the, the sort of idea of freedom it doesn't just because we're, we're aligning ourselves to god just because we're uh, able to freedom is the um is uh is to, to 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 become the people that we're meant to be doesn't mean that we're then constrained that way because once you've got a, a choice once you've got a proper choice that you can weigh up in your heart properly without the scales being weighted against against god uh, by sin then you would obviously choose that because that's the way towards towards truth and light and beauty mm. Why would I disagree with that, Tom? Oh, well, because you don't think that all, you don't think that all good comes from God, or at least you don't think that you don't think it's necessary. We had this discussion off air. If you don't remember, I thought you you, you were disagreeing with me quite strongly that that all that, that the without God, we can, no one can do good. All right. So hang on a second. You just said two different things there. I obviously believe that all good things come from God. I mean, that's look um, at example you know every good no no, no. I, no the second was what I, what I meant which is you disagree so without god no one can do good uh yeah so the effects of original sin i mean I, I think that what you've just said about augustine's understanding of original sin actually would um would confirm what i what what i said to you off air uh which is that um we are we have lost that original inclination towards supernatural righteousness which are yeah. which are which our father adam has yeah. Uh, and that, and as a result, our our loves are disordered. Um, now, I don't see anything in that view of original sin that says that people can't still do good things. Um, it just means that it just means that our actions are confused and disordered. So it doesn't. It, it, if you say, I think it's too extreme to say that human beings can't do good things um, because because it rather implies that the original sin is a total loss. Of the image of God in man, rather than a rather than a brokenness and a confusion, um, and I mean, it's it, the image of God in man is, is profoundly damaged, but it's not com it's not completely destroyed. I, and so I think I think the 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 proper understanding of Saint Augustine there would 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 um, would be something like that. And I, I don't see I don't see it as contradicting what you've just said. No, I, I think I think that the, the 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 point is that I was trying to make is that any good is inevitably an aligning of oneself with god's will any good is without, without you know nothing is impossible to be good people, except for to yeah. and people so, who are people who are not christians do things which are in accordance with god's will yeah but they that's still a, still requires god's grace for them to do that is what augustine would say even if they're not christians there's a sort of there's a level of grace that because otherwise you could you could you could sort of um eventually align yourself with god uh arguably with, without god's in, in influence or need 
Yeah, I mean, we might be we might be going too far. We might be going too far afield. I mean, I we think, are. We are. I think the notion of common grace is something we could probably both agree on. Um, but but yeah. So um, anyway, let's get let's get back. Let's to, get back back to back, back to Afghanistan. Let's get back to the news. Um, yeah. So anyway, so my so I had two two reflections on this. Okay, so the invasion of Afghanistan seems to me to be to have been an ideological invasion in the name of abstract values. Yeah. Um, progress, liberty, democracy. And so the failure of these values to take root um, in a religious and traditional culture, uh, I think shows their weakness in lieu of some kind of grounding in, in sacrality and, uh, and, and, and metaphysics, right? So, yeah. so what I mean, just to put that a little bit less abstractly, um, they're, they're hollow and empty. And, and people in other cultures which are traditional and religious can see that actually this is not really offering us anything which is substantive. And so I think that's probably largely part of the reason. The ideology of the Taliban is much more powerful. And you see, you see this in the spread of so-called radical Islam in the West as well, don't you? Like young people who grow up in secular cultures, they get, they get drawn to this stuff. Why? Because it's, it's, not, it's not because it's true or right, but it's because it's substantive. It's because there's, there's tradition, there's culture, there's metaphysics, there's ontology, there's philosophy. No, but there's... There's all the things that the secular West is sceptical of, in fact, in there. And they, they have a powerful pull still because they, they contain elements of truth. <clears throat> Obviously, um, they're not, uh, you know, the, the sort of violent Islamist um, understanding of, of life is not one we, we concur with. But, they, but, they, but in a sense, they contain more truth than, um, than, than the secular w w uh, sort of portrayal of the world as sort of empty and materialist. Um, that you know they, they've gone they're, they're wrong but they're, they share more in common in some ways with with the christian mindset than than this sort of uh the, than the most of the west these days yeah, i mean um, they, they 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 aren't um they aren't a full revelation of the truth by by no. imagination but but they do have things in common with christianity yeah which, which are true for example the the the, the world is radically dependent upon a on a, a upon a necessary uh, being who who created everything and that we owe him our we owe him our, our lives and our allegiance for example so yeah. that's that that idea in itself is very very um well it's i mean it's true it's not the it's not the full truth but that idea in itself has a powerful appeal to people uh, yeah. and, and part of that is because the secular idea of our sort of autonomous self-existence is just so empty and, and, and meaningless and pointless in in a number of different ways um, you know ontologically it doesn't make any sense um, existentially. It gives people no no grounding, no sense of identity, and you, you you could carry on with this stuff. So so anyway, I think that this idea, you know, go back to Blair, you know. So we're gonna we're gonna invade this place. We're gonna end the war on terror. We're going to bring democracy and liberty and, and notions of progress and reason and all this kind of stuff. And we're gonna reorder our world through these values. I think what this shows is that these values don't have that that power that Blair and his ilk imagine that they do. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I think if, you were, if you were actually going to do that, you would need either, I mean, there's an interesting letter in the Telegraph from a Dr. Taj Haji, who's the provost of the Oxford Institute for British Islam, who, who, who says that basically what they needed to do was, um, uh, was, um, uh, was teach a form of, of, of Quranic Islam, he calls it, uh, that, that, that rejects the hadith, uh, and the Sharia, um, sort of a liberal, uh, enlightened, um, but nonetheless grounded um, Islam. Or, I mean, the, the other argument would be simply to, to have gone in with the intention of, um, of funding um, Christian evangelism to, 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 to install these, these values into the people. But, but sort of just relying on, um, uh, relying on the sort of the, the empty materialism of the West to, to, to capture uh, the hearts and minds of a people who are uh, uh, who are or you know in, in, who are certain that God exists and that, they, that they need to order their lives t towards Him in, in their way is 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 foolish. It's arrogance, isn't it? It's just yeah. it, it, and it is so imperialistic, isn't it? Colonialist. Yeah. Um, one of the points, and this isn't my point. This is something I heard Dominic Sand Sandbrook saying, so I credit him for it. But there is an ironic contradiction here between people who say. Um, we need to decolonize the curriculum. You know, we need to decolonize British values. We need to uh, contextualize all our statues in order to remove them from the taint of slavery and colonialism. 
But on the other hand, they're saying, oh, we shouldn't leave Afghanistan, you know, because, yeah. because they need us. Yeah, well, that's the same thing the British said about India, isn't it? They need us there. In order, yeah. to, in order to help them to live civilized lives. Right, so it's what that's they said. Exactly it, the same thing. That's exactly, it's exactly what it's exactly what they said about the you know the colonial Africa. They need they need the white man to you know it's it's a ridiculous statement, um, uh, that, yeah, and you see it you see it still um, in, in in theology. You know, I, I think we've spoken about this before. I've I've heard a bishop say that they you know that without you know they they need the sort of liberal Protestantism of uh, that, that's mainstream in the Church of England. You know, in Nigeria. Because otherwise they'll, you know, otherwise they'll go all evangelical, yeah. um, and yeah. uh, it's 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 offensive. Um, but well, I, I, I mean, but Tom, but Tom, I mean, not that we want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but the notion that underlies this kind of egalitarian thought that all cultures are equally civilized is fictional. It's, well, I, it's not true. But there's also a sort of irony here, isn't there? That 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 that. that it's okay to cause death and destruction on large scales uh, as long as what you're doing it for is, is a sort of secular um, Westernism. You know, it's okay to do that, uh, you know, to, to bomb cities uh, and towns and villages and, uh, you know, uh, but it's not okay to do it in the name of um, religion, of, of religion yeah. which is a really in, which is sort of ironic. I mean, it's not okay to do it in the name of anything, I would say, uh, so it, you know, uh, uh, but but to, to to claim a moral high ground simply because you've, you're materialistic rather than um, uh, rather than uh, religious is, um, is 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 an irony there as well. Well, um, well, I mean, are you I mean, are you committing yourself to pacifism there, Tom, in saying that? Uh, well, I do not want to make that commitment at this stage. I'm not a pacifist. I think that there are points at which because I think the problem with pacifism is it doesn't allow us to pursue defense self-defense but I, i'm generally a, a, a quinian or uh, you know in as much as i think war should be self you know sh sh and, the, and, it, and the afghanistan war fails on, on many of these fronts but you know, they need to be wars of defense uh, they need to have a reasonable prospect of, of success and they need to have defined outcomes um none of which are true in afghanistan um i was, uh, I was about just war theory and i was thinking about it. this wasn't my idea it was someone else's idea but i was thinking how it'd be interesting to apply it to the war on um, the war on viruses, and to see yeah. that that's a that's a just war. Um, no, but I mean, I I don't I don't know what I think about it, Tom. I'm I'm kind of torn in between the pacifist position and and more like your kind of position. But uh, what you said relates to um, something I've been reading about recently, which is about the uh, Catholic uh, theologian William Kavanaugh, who makes exactly the point you've just made, which is that the secular masquerades as objective and rational, and says that vi religion is violent and irrational. And so that self-definition validates our violence, which is reasonable and necessary, against religious violence, which is, just, which is always unreasonable and, and fanatical. And so, um, so I think, again, I think you can see that here. Our violence is okay. It's okay for us to go in and colonize another nation and cause all sorts of havoc, because we're doing it in the name of reason and progress and secularism. Um, but their violence is 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 wrong and it's because it's irrational yeah 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 and it might be the case i mean to be honest with you, i can't i can't say what's going on in afghanistan i think there's there's quite a lot of propaganda at the moment about how the talib what the taliban are doing is so awful and so on um i heard a report of a guy who knows people on the ground uh on a on um, tom woods's podcast and he said it's actually no it's actually nowhere near as bad as the western media are making out at currently and it's been a very peaceful takeover largely speaking um, now i don't know about that but we're inclined to see their violence as worse than our violence and and as though we can't do unspeakable things when we go to other countries uh, we can't for example be held to be responsible for the murder of civilians but 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 all you have to do is look at the behavior of american troops in vietnam and see what they did in that in that context to see that this is just an absolute fantasy you know violence is violence whether it's done in the name of religion or secularism you know it's 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 just it's a it's a very sort of self-serving definition of secularism to say that it's something which justifies violence uh, over and against a religious understanding which would which would justify violence um for for 
basically similar reasons, you know, to preserve one's culture or to defend oneself against one's enemies, whatever it might be. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot there, but I think it, you know, really it kind of reveals the, the sort of really, I mean, the sort of emptiness really that's at the heart of our, that's the heart of our culture. And just to go back to that thing about McIntyre, the subjectivism, you know, the emotivism, yeah. that we don't have a framework. So nobody, nobody really knows, was it, was it right to go in? Should we have done it? Um, is it right to come out? You know, what would it be right? Well, to- it, I mean, that's, that's, that's why the, the fails the sort of third of the, the criteria for a just war is that there's no definable outcomes. What do they want to do? What do they, what do they think they would achieve? Um, well, they thought that they would, um, they thought that they would uh, just leave, leave a Western de- de- democracy in, in Afghanistan, you know, yeah. um, but, but without. Then, it's interesting, with, isn't it? The, the, the thing, well, if their outcome was to end terror, it's very similar just to bring it up to date, to the idea that we can now, um, we can now stop people dying from infectious diseases, isn't it? It's very sort of, it's very sort of abstract war on something, you know, all right, so we we know it's a virus, but we don't really know where the virus is or who has it or how to stop it. Just like terror. I mean, how can you have a war on terror? I mean, you know, seriously. I mean, mean, the only, the only, the only war that you, it's, I guess the the only thing you could do, which is pretty much the opposite of of what we tried, is is to stop people being afraid of it, which would be to use rational and uh, you know, I mean, fundamentally, the only way of stop being afraid of terror is is to is to is to follow Christ in saying, "Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but be afraid of those who destroy the soul," um, you know, uh, and accept that, um, and accept you know, and, and accept our. So, and, I, and I suspect that if, if people stopped reacting to terror, then um, then the people who per- perpetrate it would might well um, might well cease to do it because the whole point is it's a political statement that, rec- that, that then gets everyone into a fuss. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it's and awful. How- don't, get, don't get me wrong; it's awful. People killing people in order to make a political point, which is what terror is really, uh, is 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 dreadful. Uh, but the more we react to it, the the you know the the more they'll do it. Yeah, and, and how ironic, isn't it, Tom, that 20 years later, after the war on terror started, we've got governments who are propagandising their population precisely in order to induce terror, terror in them. And the yeah. other thing, which I may have said on this podcast before, is, is back then, and, and also more recently, you know, when we had the Manchester bombing and everything like that, um, you, you have immediately after these things happen, you have two things. The politicians come out and say, number one, this isn't real Islam. And then number two... Um, is we, we must continue to live our lives in our way with our values and our freedoms because they hate our freedoms, right? So how ironic is it that when a virus comes along, oh, our freedoms don't matter, you know? It, it's, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's if, ironic. If we give away our freedoms, they've won, the terrorists have won. So does that mean that the virus has won, you know? Um, but I mean, it's, it's worse than that, really, isn't it? Because they say that and then they, you know, put in yet another set of irritating security checks and you know etc 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 uh which which mean that we're not actually exercising our freedoms you know go back 50 years a long time in italy and international travel was much i mean it's much more expensive but it's pretty much you know you can walk walk on walk onto an airport and jump on a plane and you know off you go well i, uh, I think it was just before september 11th you could do that kind of thing couldn't you i mean i can't really remember but that's what i hear people saying is that you just you just sort of got to the airport show them your boarding pass and you're on yeah and now you're on i haven't been to an airport for a while but now you're there for hours aren't you doing various checks and all kinds of stuff uh, but as anyway. you said, these things are always utilized in order to bring greater levels of control yeah uh, and so the idea that it's being done in the name of freedom is uh, that's irony isn't it uh, completely uh, yeah I, I need to go to a quick um, toilet stop jamie sorry um, okay pausing recording now okay after a short comfort break as they say in the u.s we are back once again we're going to talk now about madness north of the border north of the wall tom north of the wall well i think we should build a wall at this rate you know just to keep uh, sturgeon out really mostly the rest of the scots can come through but uh, her, her government has just gone bonkers haven't they um, there, there are two yeah, things republic of uh, what do they call it? <laughs> <laughs> kim jong i what did they call her i can't remember they sort of uh, made a um, a mashup of her name with Kim Jong Il. I can't. I can't remember what it is. There's a, there's a hilarious video of um, no, not a video. The image on lockdown skeptics. I thought, which I, I rather liked. Um, 
uh, with uh, it's a picture of um, Sturgeon at the front with uh, Kim Jong, whatever, whichever Kim, Kim Jong Il, yeah, yeah. uh, clapping in the background. It's very funny. Um, so, so I mean, that's the first one. You know, um, there's you know, it's another one of those. Uh, quote unquote you know conspiracy theories that that once again we see, we see coming true in certain places um which is uh it's, it's and it you know i always got blank looks when i've said this to people but that the governments can't be trusted with extraordinary powers of the sort that we've given them or that we they've been that they've taken uh because they you know when something when when you know a temporary power is all too much uh a chance to become a permanent one and here we have the scottish government trying to uh maintain changes that have been welcomed by people uh who now don't want to lose transformations that have been in innovative during the pandemic so they want <laughs> you know uh basically they, they want to keep the power to lock people down whenever they like whenever they want uh and they want to okay. keep you know you know and various other ones um yeah because uh Close schools requiring people to wear face, face coverings. They want them not to be temporary uh, solutions to a um, short term problem, but, but long term powers held by the government. Now, there's, you know, this is this is why it's such a bad idea to let governments have these powers in the first place. Not that uh, we've had much choice in the matter, but you know, it's exactly what Lord Sumption was uh, was saying would happen. It's exactly what a lot of people have been saying would happen, and we've just been told, oh no, it's only for the emergency, isn't it? Governments like these powers because governments like to have power, yeah. and that's that's why there are constitutions. That's why it's so important that uh, that, that that these things are justified. But you know, uh, one of the things I think about this, Tom, is that don't these people realise that they're not going to be in power forever, and then they'll have to live in the society that they've created under the dictatorship of someone else? Unless, of course, does Sturgeon is is she going to stay there forever? I don't know. She, well, quite possibly. <laughs> um, she's appointed her herself as as ruler for life yeah. uh, over the Democrat of the People's Republic of Scotland. Yeah. I, love, I love that series of euphemisms you read out. Where did, was that from? The Telegraph article. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Welcome this. And now yeah. they want to. What did it say? Want to don't want to lose transformations that have been innovative during the pandemic. Innovative transformations. What? That's a wonderful euphemism, isn't it? Makes it yeah like for house arrest. Yeah, one, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing has happened. Oh yes, yeah. innovative transformation has been welcomed by the public. Let me tell you this: uh, it's not innovative uh, because uh, the the idea of keeping people in you know happily in their homes uh arbitrarily is not is not a new one it has been used many times over the years mostly by states of the sort which you would never want to live in you know it's, it's not it's not you know it's it's not new is it curfews house arrest and house arrests the apostle paul was under house arrest wasn't he yeah, yeah. In the book of acts yeah uh, yeah it's terrible so just on an aside tom i know we're doing scottish madness and we we should carry on with this um but it's terrible what's going on in Australia, isn't it? How they've got this zero COVID policy, and they're basically well, it, closing down in yeah. enormous ways. It's, it's more, it's, it's more government madness, isn't it? and New Zealand as well with their ten cases, complete lockdown. Um, it, it's the problem with the zero COVID idea is that it's it's it, it's untenable in the long term, and as we now know that vaccines don't actually stop you catching or transmitting the disease, it's completely pointless. They they've destroyed their uh, societies pointlessly. Yeah. Um, but they're doubling down on it they need they need metanoia you know they need a change of mind and to accept that this is this strategy is not working but um yeah madness so tom more madness in scotland what else is going on uh so there's this report that now uh, from the, the idea that scottish four-year-olds can change their gender uh in school without parental consent so uh you know, um, presumably a, you know, I mean, four-year-olds quite often pretend to be different things, don't they, Jamie? I, I've not yet got a four-year-old, but you've had them. Uh, do, do, do yeah. you know, is that fair enough to say? Yeah, you so know. childhood is a time of experimentation, isn't yeah. it? And, yeah. and I'm sure we've said before, but it's a point that um, Rowan Williams makes in his book. Uh, uh, I think it's in the... On I'd, uh, icons, uh, lost icons. Lost icons, yeah. Is that one of the, one of the freedoms that children enjoy is to not have their actions and words taken seriously because that because that's part of the freedom of childhood so children say ridiculous things and you don't hold them to account in the same way as you do adults because they're children and they're still developing and if you were to do that that would that would preclude 
the the very nature of, of childhood it would it would make it would make childhood into something entirely different if you if you if you ask a four year old for example to take responsibility for everything he says and does so just to give an example of this as i was reading this article my three year old so he's not four so not ready to change his gender thank goodness but my three year old likes to paint his nails with my wife's nail varnish now does that mean he's a woman really does that mean he's actually female or is he just experimenting with with different colors on his on his nails do you know what i mean if i was in that kind of mindset i'd already be thinking oh my second child is transgender whereas actually what i think is he's just experimenting with nail varnish and and different colors on his nails do you see what i mean because because he sees his mom doing and and a lot of these things of course are culturally conditioned which is one of the issues with um with trans with with the whole ideology is that you know there's there's no reason why a, a, a man shouldn't wear a dress other than the cultural conditioning uh you know uh, in scotland i believe they sometimes do so um the um you know it's <laughs> it's um uh it, you know just because they're experimenting with something doesn't mean that they are a, a, a girl trapped in a boy and they're, they're, they're all these i mean the, the article um has all these sort of pretty awful uh, sort of propaganda that they're being uh, given the recommended reading list, including uh, um, oh, yeah. a story, a story about a blue crayon, which suffers an identity crisis because it was mistakenly labeled as red. Well, that, you know, um, applying that straight to humanity uh, leads us in a sort of metaphysical crisis. I don't know quite how you can at the same time justify materialism uh, uh, and, um, and transgenderism, but that's one of the kind of, uh, one of the issues in the middle of it. And yeah. another one uh, features a primary school age narrator who says she has a girl brain, but a boy body and claims she knew she was trans- transgender as a toddler. Uh, you know, and it's, um, I just think, uh, uh, you know, it, it's propaganda and it's, it's confusing. Uh, and it's and it's relying on a metaphysical back uh, sort of backup that that is certainly not Christian and, and it doesn't even chime well with with the claims of the materialist secularists either. So it's it's kind of you know um, it's I mean and, and the, add, add that into the fact that these are four year olds. They're four year olds and it's being done without parental permission. You think you know. Um, what are the rights of the parent in Scotland? Um, very yeah. little, it turns out. Yeah, and so this lady, Marion Calder, who's, um, she runs the Four Women Scotland campaign group, um, says that this is a, it's a dangerous ideology that the Scottish government are pushing, and it's a failure in safeguarding and a removal of parental rights. And mm. I, think, I think she's absolutely right. You know, um, children are vulnerable persons under the safeguarding rubric. So to have, a say, a four-year-old who starts, you know, manifesting some kind of supposedly transgender behavior. Um, and then for you to start suggesting to that child certain things that without even consulting with their parents, which could leave that child into a full blown transgender identity crisis and may even result in them having, you know, this, this, this so-called surgery, which is actually mutilation is i mean you know for to, tom you know I, as you know i'm not a polemical person and i rarely say controversial things but it is, it is child abuse and um it's you know to, i just i don't really know what to say about this it's absolutely horrific and uh, if i was uh, if i was if i had kids in a school that were doing this i would i would not i would not allow it um yeah. unbelievable unbelievable really it's it's crazy um douglas murray's book which I read, it was a couple of years ago, I read it now, but The Madness of Crowds, he's got really good stuff on um, transgenderism and the way that children are treated. Um, yeah. so any further, have you read that book? Is it good I book? haven't, no, I need to, I need to get a copy. Um, yeah, 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 it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. All right, so craziness in Scotland. And we do, you know, we have lots of people who listen in Scotland, so we do, uh, we do feel for you up yeah. there, north of the border. But Scotland is a beautiful country. But like New Zealand and, and many other beautiful com- countries, unfortunately, it's currently under the control of um, people who manifest fascist tendencies. Uh, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, right. Should we move on and talk about? Yeah. So I just there's something we've sort of been hedging around for a while now, which is and talking about some of the and it's sort of we, we've done it a bit before. But there's this very interesting article, which um, I wanted to sort of. Uh, 
uh, highlight, which is um, uh, the, the idea, the, the sort of the, va the vaccine question, and, and whether a Christian should take a take a vaccine uh, of um, COVID vaccine. And um, there are a number of, uh, you know, there are a number of things which um, uh, which need to be talked about quite frankly. Uh, and there's this wonderful uh, campaign group called Children of God for Life, and they they're uh, they're a Christian Catholic um, campaign group, um, and they are uh, they're very concerned about the use of uh, aborted fetal tissue in medical research, development, and production of drugs. Um, and they and they've, um, they've, they've this is this art, very interesting article which which um, looks at one of the uh, criticisms of of what we've said in the past and, and the criticism is that you know a, a lot of drugs and a lot of medical research rely on um, uh, the use of um, fetal cell lines um, and um, and, th and this article. Uh, is 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 a sort of repose to that which which basically says that um that yes um some uh that the, the, some drugs have been tested uh on um fetal cell lines one of them for example is aspirin but the aspirin can't possibly be uh, you know be a, be morally tainted by this because aspirin was developed first in 1900 and was, you know in fact i believe uh, 1853 uh and so therefore, you know, the, the, the subsequent testing by scientists of that drug on, uh, on fetal cell lines is not, you know, it, it doesn't taint that drug. On the other hand, the, 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 both of the vaccines, well, we know that AstraZeneca uses it to, to formulate the, 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 um, the, the vaccine, but Pfizer and Moderna use them regularly to, um, to test it, and they did it through the uh, through the production. They they um, they used them to create uh, um, the uh, originally they used the HEK. I think it's HEK two one three um, to where is it um, HEK two nine two nine three yeah. um, stands for human embryonic kidney uh, experiment number two hundred ninety three. Uh, this was a a child that was killed in the womb. Uh, and uh the um uh, the, the they used used that particular cell line to formulate spike proteins in order to, to generate their um uh the virus the sort of um rna uh vaccines and then they use it to test it throughout the production so unlike aspirin or, or various other drugs where it's been since the, the drug was produced other people have tested it on these things the, these are critical to the production and, and testing of the uh, of the vaccines and that, and that is morally no different from producing it um, uh, so I mean I think I think if we're going to take a stand uh, then this is one we need to take you know it's because you know, it it is encouraging the current and future use of of, of new aborted stem stem cell lines in um, in the um, in, in medical research, yeah. um, and it's something that Christianity should have something to say about. Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, article you and we'll share that article. Obviously, the other article you shared, Tom, on the Anglican Sam's Sam is that. I always find that word hard to um, uh, pronounce. Um, it's called the plague the plague the vaccine and our jeremiah moment and i think it's i think it's a very good article because it contrasts two different narrative understandings of what's happened you know one is that we've had this terrible affliction and that through god's gracious gift of the vaccine or you know our capacity to develop a vaccine we're now going to be delivered from it but actually when you take into account this issue uh it's very hard to sustain that narrative and you know i didn't really know very much about this before all this stuff started and, and i know there are lots of christians who who don't see it this way but i'm increasingly convinced that um this is ethically unacceptable so the the most the most powerful part of this um article in my view is when the author summarizes the, the roman catholic position on the vaccine so I'll just read some of this. It is morally acceptable to take such a vaccine if no alternative is available because the abortion was not performed for the express purposes of har harvesting the baby's organ for sale to a laboratory. 
uh, that was incidental to the abortion and the use of the vaccine is not encouraging further abortions. Um, so that, and that, that logic, as far as I know, I've listened to a bit on this. I think that is basically what, what the Roman Catholic taught, church has taught about this. Um, so the, the conclusion of that being that there's no material co cooperation with the evil of, of abortion. This author writes, in my view, the argument is flawed for a couple of reasons, a couple of reasons. So firstly, it has recently come to light that the University of Pittsburgh has been aborting babies by induction so that they re remain intact a requirement for optimal organ harvesting. The may, babies may still be alive when they're induced. Indeed, they may still be alive when they, are, when they are dissected. The organs once removed are sold to laboratories for medical experiments, just as a kidney and iris were to develop our, sorry, just as a kidney and iris were to develop our COVID-19 vaccines. To consume the vaccine is to grant, grant tacit assent to a demonic abomination, an abomination which would have no reason to continue if all refused to inject the fruits of its macabre experiments. And that's a good point, isn't it, Tom? Because if we all said no to this, this would stop. This, this yeah. harvesting that, that this would be harvesting fine. of aborted children would stop. This is an industry. And that's why I think the Roman Catholic logic is wrong here. This is, this is a material cooperation in the act of abortion because it's, a, because it's a cooperation in the industry of abortion. It's part of what the abortion industry is, is that children are sold their, the parts of their body are sold, children which have been killed, uh, these, their parts of the body have been sold in order to develop vaccines. And this is profoundly immoral, and it is a participation in the industry of abortion. So I, I'm convinced about this now. And, and, I, and I am too. And the other, the other thing, of course, is that if um, it's, you know, it's not beyond the... Uh, I'm, I'm certain that, that if this was considered to be morally unacceptable and 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 science and science moved away from it that the other ways of producing these things would be found that were not morally tainted you know that because you know we, we, the humanity is um is endlessly innovative uh just as god is endlessly in innovative you know we would find a way around it um but if we don't take a stand then it will never change it will yep. never change and uh so it, it is you know it is really important um, that, 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 that that is emphasised. And I think, um, and I, I'm really glad that John Piper agrees as well. It's a, another um, article that we have, uh, that we're going to sort of flag up about this, um, that, in, that there needs to be a Christian witness about this. And unfortunately, the, the church has done just the opposite. Um, the Church of England, at least, has, 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 um, has encouraged and exhorted uh, its, its uh, congregants to take it. We shouldn't be taking the fruits of evil uh, that that's not i mean that's a very it's you know it's 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 a very slippery slope if you if you do that you know you know morally speaking the church would say um you know that that, uh, that an aborted uh, child is just as morally um wrong as as killing an adult so would we kill an adult to save uh, you know 20 people yeah you know would would, would we ever do that yeah. um uh or indeed um uh the the other serious problem is um that it, that, that it continues you know there, there this, these are still happening yeah. um and that's not to say anything of the of, of whether you know we ought to um and we certainly ought to think about um these these cell lines are not just hek 293 uh they're, they're bodily remains of, of a dead child yeah. you know and they're being sold bred you know grown um stored used discarded you know that's but we, we, we've spoke at the beginning of this podcast about how christ coming to to, to be human has, has sanctified humanity you know and, and flesh, yeah. sanctified, you know, matter. sanctified matter so you know is that is that a way that we deal with these things we no. the church of england has very clear guidelines and you know humanity has always had very clear guidelines about um about what um you know how to deal with with the, the deceased matter of of, uh, of humanity which is to yeah. treat it with respect because it will become our resurrection bodies frequency, uh, yeah yeah so to do that to children i think it's an index of the moral depravity of our society so yeah piper's got these four principles hasn't he we should never do evil that good may come romans 3 8 we value christ and his kingdom more than security or health we testify to the sanctity of life and that God blesses principled action in his name. That's one of the things I don't like about the Roman Catholic view on this, which is that if, if something else isn't available, then we should use this. Well, well, 
I mean, shouldn't we be pressing them to make something else available rather yeah. than participating in this and in principle saying, no, we're not, we're not going to have anything to do with this. And that's, that's where I think, I think you're right, Tom, that the church across the board has failed to act with any discernible Christian principles over this matter. And I would actually broaden it out to say just in general, I think over the year, last year and a half, that the church has failed to implement any kind of real Christian principles in a, in a way which is analogous to the breakdown of principled action in politics as well. You know, this kind of post principle politics, uh, which we've had for, for so long. And just to, just to um, go back to the, the um, Samid Sat, um, Samid Dat um, thing about the narrative, right? So we've had this narrative, oh, God has blessed us with the vaccine. Let's give thanks for the vaccine. The vaccine, the vaccine is actually developed using dead children's bodies okay so that's the first thing and then and then he 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 ends by making the point and this was released on august the 12th that um in israel the majority of the population has received two pfizer injections and yet the headline as of i suppose it was august the 11th is that if health officials predict thousands of seriously ill covid patients within a month and it goes on to say that israeli hospitals have to prepare for an influx of nearly 5,000 coronavirus patients within weeks, half of whom will need acute care to deal with severe bouts of COVID-19. Health officials have warned this. And if you compare this to countries which haven't bought into this narrative hook, line and sinker, although they are, as far as I know, still using vaccines, um, the ones who haven't believed this narrative and, and participated in it are actually getting back to normal, like, like Sweden, like we've talked about before. And, yeah. um, and well, so, they, they are vaccinating in Sweden, but yeah. yeah, they are. They are. That's true. But but what it what it shows is that using these vaccines and all these other draconian measures is not is not helping. Yeah. And, and that, that narrative yeah. that we are sort of delivering ourselves uh, through these things is is highly questionable. And and to just to just to add one more thing uh, is that there are actually some. Um, uh, vaccines in development which are ethical they're not using um human child ch children to make them uh and these uh however they're not um they're not yet generally available or licensed um so prayers that that will happen uh, though we don't have no idea because you know i i'm not an anti i'm not against vaccinations i'm very happy to take a vaccination that isn't tainted in this way um, but once you discover, and I, to be honest, I didn't know about this issue until I started researching these these vaccinations. And until once you know, once you know about this issue, then you have to act, don't you? Um, that's the thing; you can't be held responsible for that for sin that you don't know about. But once you once you know about something as grave as this, I think I think you know you do have to th think about it. I think Tom. I mean, this is quite um, this is quite a general um, sort of ethical point to make. But I think you can be held responsible for sin that you don't know about. Um, and uh, and I think there are. I'm just trying to think of some scriptural examples. But but uh, so say for example, the Apostle Paul. I mean, he he very much thought that he was participating in a righteous way, didn't he, when he was persecuting the Church of Christ? Ah, uh, yeah. But I mean, but once he discovered that he was sinning, then he ceased and sought forgiveness. I mean, that that's what we're that's that's what we need to do, isn't yeah, it? That's, that's what. But, that's what we meant. It is. You know, but, but if but if he had never, you know. If, if you, if you, if for example, I had never found out that these vaccines did this, then I, I don't think I could have been held in blame that, 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 that for example, I'd been injected before I knew. Um, but, you know, once you know, you have to do something about it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I won't, I won't, I won't, um, I won't nitpick. I think, I think the, I think the situation is slightly more complicated than that, but I, I see, I see the point you're making. Um, I am sceptical, Tom, of the medical industry. As you know, I've become far more sceptical than I ever was before. I mean, mainly because I didn't really think about it before. Um, but uh, I, think that, I think that there's a huge amount of corruption there. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to comment further necessarily on the development of an ethical vaccine. But no, I, would, I would still be sceptical about it uh, for, for, for multiple reasons. But um, we, we, we can agree to leave it there, I think, can't we? Um, yeah. I think so. I think we're basically on the same page about this. Um, yeah, so Tom, uh, we're going to have to finish in a minute. Uh, so let's finish with a nice uh, couple of emails. Someone emailed this morning actually saying they'd had something removed from Facebook. 
and uh, asking what we think about Facebook. What do you think about Facebook, Tom? Do you like Facebook? Uh, I'm, I don't like Facebook. I've, I've removed myself from everything except for Messenger. I, I, had a, I have another account which, is, uh, which I use purely to keep in contact with... Um, there's one Facebook page I need to be part of um, for my hobby of miniature gaming. But other than that, um, I, uh, I don't have Facebook. Cycling, bell ringing, miniature gaming, yeah. music, singing. So yeah. many. You're a man of, you're a renaissance man, Tom. I've been growing cyclamen recently as well. That's my other my little Great, hobby. Cyclamen, cyclamen. What's that? It's a type of plant. Oh, very good. Uh, yet another hobby. Uh, right, great. Okay, so email of the week. Uh, comes from Peter. So thank you so much for your wonderful podcasts. I enjoy them so much. I get more common sense and balanced viewpoints from you guys than almost anything in the MSM or from experts, which I have frankly given up watching as it just feels manipulative, controlling and patronizing to me. Amen, brother. Uh, I note that you have read letters on your podcasts and had contributions. Uh, I wonder if a poem would be a nice thing to have too. It does seem to me that reasoning with the government and those in power is having very little effect. I wonder if a more emotive writing, such as poetry, might also help get our point across. Anyhow, I wrote this poem today inspired by you guys about the way our children have been cruelly kept apart from grandparents under government diktat. It is not particularly religious or secular, but speaks to both, I hope. It's very happy to read, for us to read it out. So I'm going to read this poem by Peter. Uh, and here we are. You cannot make a songbird sing, though caged and clipped of nature's wing, or tar the feathers in the nest of children's love that they possess. Behind your bars where they reside will fail to hold back loving tides, for will to love and what they are is stronger than your prison bar. And in that place you safely blight, deny their will to nature's flight, to stop all harms and all that's bad, denies the love they should have had. Well, that's very nice actually it's very nice yeah scans really well it's and of course all that's bad des- denies the love they should have had that's a good uh, good couplet there isn't it yeah, yeah. sorry what were you going to say no I, I thought it was really lovely actually um yeah thank Seri- you the serious point there i think is that he's right that argument just doesn't work does it i think that's, yeah. that's one of the things i've i think i've realized is that um you know rational argument is not convincing anyone <laughs> Um, well, I, was, I chatted to this, actually, I should have mentioned it before, because I, I did a podcast with um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, um, uh, who was oh, it? Danny, with? Danny Duran. Danny, Danny yeah. Duran, that's it. And uh, we talked about, you know, how to persuade people. And, uh, you know, yes, it's a straight out rational argument doesn't work. I think um, gentle chipping away at the narrative can help. But uh, yeah, in the end, it's, it's an emotive thing. Yeah, I think people have been people have been very scared, haven't they? And it, it's hard to it's hard to unscare people, and uh, it's, it's arguably it's arguably more scary to tell people that the narrative that has been proclaimed by the BBC uh, for the last eighteen months is basically entirely false. And Which uh, I mean, life is terrible, terrifying, isn't it? In a sense, you know. There's f- fear is everywhere. I mean, if you, if you didn't have, if I didn't have faith in Christ, I think it would be quite terrifying to live. Um, so yeah. I'm not surprised, you know. Yeah, and, but I think one of the things I've noticed is how I, to some extent, to a very great extent, actually, was very dependent upon the news in order to shape my reality for me, to sort of tell me how things were. And it's quite a scary thing to realise that actually this is mostly just rubbish. And, you know, I don't know what's going on. And you can't trust the BBC. I mean, I knew you couldn't trust the BBC. I knew that anyway, but I didn't know it was, I didn't know the problem was as bad as it actually is. And I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get that the BBC is just propaganda, basically. I didn't understand that. I thought it was a mixture of, you know, some biased journalism, but also some objective reporting on the facts. But I think one of the things you see, and again, I knew this, but it's sort of taken on a new reality is, is that the news is always perspectival, isn't it? It's always, there's always, there are always choices. The idea of impartiality is just, not, it's just nonsense. So the BBC, it chooses to um, cover, you know, famous example, the Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion protests in a sympathetic way. It ignores the lockdown protests and misrepresents them when it does when it does cover them, it's completely ignored the fact that there have been millions and millions of people protesting in France over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's completely ignored it. 
you know, and, and, and it's, an, it's, it's an extreme example, but the news is always like this. Yeah. You know, our show's like this. We've decided what to cover. You know, there are, there are things that we could have covered, which we haven't, um, because, you know, it's subjective. It's our decision. Um, so I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with that, apart from just don't trust the news, except for us, if, we are, if indeed we are news, which I don't know that we are. But anyway... Tom, we should probably leave it there. That was a bit of a ramble to finish off with. We yeah, we'll see. Descended, we descended into incoherence here. Uh, yeah. We were going to discuss the... Um, incel. Incel subculture, weren't we? But uh, we're going to... We'll have to do it next week. we leave it because we'd like Daniel to be here when, when he, we talk about that. So mm. that's putting pressure on Daniel to actually... Turn up. ...be here next week. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about incel next week. And, um, oh, a few notices. I forgot to do a new notice. So, um, yeah, so... This uh, show is Irreverend, Faith and Current Affairs. If you'd like to support us, join our Patreon community, patreon.com forward slash irreverent. And you can join us for as little as £1.50 plus, plus VAT, plus VAT, plus VAT uh, of 20% per month. So you can join our uh, Patreon community, get the podcast slightly early, get access to all the people there, including us occasionally and uh join that uh our um, telegram group is up and running vibrant uh t.me forward slash irreverent is that where is that where everyone is these days is that where it's at yeah telegram is really good and i think the reason is because it promotes harmony unlike twitter which promotes antagonism so you Mm -hmm. you you choose to join channels on telegram so so everyone on our channel we've got over 500 people there now they want to be there and and it's nice because people are all all, uh, kind of like-minded um so Telegram is a good place to go. Uh, Twitter, we're at Irreverent Pod. Um, and uh, what else is there? Yeah, our YouTube channel, search Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs. Audio, if you want to listen to us on podcasts, irreverent.buzzprout.com. And our sermon audio, we've been a bit patchy recently, but we're back up this week with something from Daniel, Irreverent Sermon, audio.buzzprout.com. And Odyssey as well. We're on Odyssey if you don't want to use YouTube. That was a lot of notices, Jamie. Oh, yeah. Probably too many. Email, uh, the email the show. Email the show. Email us. Irreverentpod at gmail.com. We like emails. Send us poems. We like poems. Yeah, send us more poems, funny poems or serious poems or other genres. Um, and also anything, really. Anything. We like it. Just send us anything. Just any attention. Uh, something we, we crave. Yeah. Crave Good. Attention. Thank you, everyone. We need to pray, Tom. We do. I'll pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've spent together. We pray for our listeners and our watchers that they may be blessed, that their hearts may be opened, that they may be uh, kept safe, and that they may have a wonderful day having listened to this. Um, Pray for uh, Scotland that um, the government may turn from their folly, uh, and governments across the world may turn from their folly and embrace humanity. Amen. Amen. So thanks, Tom, and thanks to everyone for listening. And we'll be with you again next time. Goodbye. God bless.